Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Jimmy Dore Show. We have a special guest today. Norm Finkelstein is an American political scientist, activist, professor, and author. His primary fields of research are the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and the politics of the Holocaust. Any interest motivated by the experiences of his parents who were Jewish Holocaust survivors. He's a graduate of Binghamton University and received his Ph.D. in political science from Princeton University. Welcome, Norm Finkelstein. Thanks for being our guest. Well, thank you for having me. You know, uh, you're an expert on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and I just wanted to, you know, most people don't really know the cause of the conflict. They just know that there is a conflict and that the United States is friendly to Israel because they're a democracy and they're the only democracy in the Middle East, people like to say. So if... How would you, how do you explain this to people who don't really know much about it, which is most of the people in the United States, and they certainly don't know much about it if they watch the TV news. So your average person, I don't think, knows anything really about it. So how do you inform people about that conflict, how it started and what it's about? I think the most effective way to inform people is by way of analogy. Effectively, what happened to the Palestinian people uh, over the past century is pretty close to what happened to the Native American population in the United States. If you take, for example, the fate of the Cherokee Indians, who uh, originally resided on the eastern coast of the United States, and they were gradually pushed, 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 until they ended up in Arkansas, and then they were uh, pushed into a portion of Arkansas, which then once or white settlers crowded in that portion, it became Oklahoma. Uh, And so the Cherokee were effectively the um, uh, victims of a policy of of expulsion, transfer, if you want to call it, in the Israeli vernacular. And basically, there are obviously differences, and one doesn't want to pretend as if there are no differences, But to look at the big picture, the big picture, I would say, is not fundamentally different than what happened to the native population in the U.S. Wow. So that I've never heard it described that way before. That's a. And, you know, ironically, I, uh, you know, most Americans aren't too aware of how horrible that's a chapter in our history is either. So. So the, the United States gives aid and funding, billions of dollars in funding to Israel every year. And people say that Israel is running an apartheid state and that uh, Gaza is an open air prison. Now, are those two things true? And how could that be? How could that be if we're supporting them? Well, I think both facts are true. Uh, Israel uh, both benefits from two facts. Number one, it benefits from the fact that there is a convergence of interests between U.S. ruling elites and Israel on many basic issues. So, for example, right now, there is a convergence of interests between the U.S. and Israel in strengthening Saudi Arabia, strengthening the Gulf, and trying to contain uh, Iran. That's a fundamental convergence of interest, and that, in part, Probably in the most significant part, it explains U.S. support for Israel. But there is also another factor, and one shouldn't pretend as if that other factor doesn't exist, which is to say there is a very powerful Israel lobby uh, operating in the United States, not unlike the gun lobby, the uh, Cuba lobby. Uh, The Israel lobby is another lobby, very effective probably one of the most, if not the most effective lobbies operating in Washington. And its core component is a very powerful, articulate, and organized American Jewish community. Uh, Though even there you have to enter qualifications, because among younger Jews, there's certainly a uh, diminishing of uh, support for Israel. But the big picture is both because of a convergence of interests and because of a powerful, articulate, organized, strategically placed lobby, a lobby that has a lot of influence in the media, a lot of influence in publishing, a lot of influence in journals of opinion, 
uh, a lot of in uh, influence in Hollywood. Uh, that that uh, lobby uh, has been a, a, a major factor in determining aspects of U.S. policy towards uh, Israel. Uh, now, on the second point, I don't really think it's any longer controversial whether or not Israel is an apartheid state. I don't st say this as a polemicist. I'm trying to be objective and dispassionate about the situation. Um, there are between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea, there are roughly now, you could say, about uh, 12 or 13 million people, roughly. Uh, now, uh, that includes the West Bank, it includes East Jerusalem, it includes Gaza. And Israel has controlled the West Bank, East Jerusalem, Gaza. It's controlled it now for more than a half century. And the Israeli government has made it clear that it has no intention whatsoever of returning to the borders from the June 1967 war, that is, pre-controlling West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem. So we can't any longer talk about an occupation. We have to be talking about an annexation. The territories have been de facto annexed. After a half century, that seems to me to be the reasonable conclusion. There has been a de facto annexation. So of all that population that stretches from the Mediterranean to the Jordan River, roughly, roughly speaking, about half has either second class status or overwhelmingly no rights whatsoever within the state. Uh, no voting rights, and then from there down, they don't even have rights to property. Uh, property can be confiscated overnight at a whim with the support of the courts. So it seems to me, again, trying to be rational, trying to be objective, and trying to be dispassionate, there's no other term to describe a situation in which close to half the population close to half the population either has second-class rights, that would be within Israel proper, or no rights whatsoever, which would be the West Bank and Gaza. Um, that's an apartheid situation. But again, that shouldn't shock us. You have to remember, I don't know how old you are, but I have a vivid recollection. Um, during the last days of apartheid, Ronald Reagan supported the apartheid regime, as did Margaret Thatcher. Uh, they were calling, till the very end, Reagan and Thatcher were calling Nelson Mandela and the ANC, the African National Congress, uh, terrorist organizations. So if our government was, until the very end, our, at the end of apartheid, if our government was supporting South Africa because it saw it as a bastion of Western, uh, uh, a bastion of Western, uh, uh, call it civilization, whatever you want to call it, in Africa, so for the same reason they support Israel in the Middle East. So, <clears throat> you think it's without because I, you know, you say it's without question that uh, Israel's an apartheid state, which I agree with. But there are people who question it. People very loudly push back against that, and they they quote the numbers of Palestine. Well, they say there's a Palis there's an Arab political party that's the third largest party in Israel, and that all they they quote numbers of Palestinians who are allowed to vote. What do you say to those arguments? Well, first of all, I'm glad you asked the questions because there's no effective, no more effective way to have a discussion than for some one of us to play the devil's advocate. In this case, it should be you. First of all, I tried to be clear. I said there is a gradation of rights. In the case of Israel, the Palestinians have second-class rights. Israel has now officially uh, uh, declared that. It declared Israel as the nation-state of the Jewish people. So I, for example, am Jewish, and if the United States were declared the nation-state of the Christian people, I would certainly experience that declaration, especially once it becomes enacted in laws. I would certainly experience that as me being a second-class citizen. That is to say, I don't belong here. 
It's the state of the Christian people. It's not my state. But having said that, let's keep in mind that that's only one component of the Palestinian population that's under Israeli control uh, or has been effectively annexed by Israel. The West Bank, people in the West Bank, they don't vote in Israeli elections. They're not represented in the Israeli Knesset. The people in Gaza, they don't vote in Israeli elections. They're not uh, represented in the Israeli parliament, the Israeli Knesset. So far, the vast, the vast preponderance of Palestinians currently annexed to the Israeli state, they have no rights whatsoever. Okay. Uh, I don't know how else. The only way you can get around that is by saying that, well, there's a peace process, but the Israeli government has already made clear uh, you'd have to be blinder than King Lear not to see that the Israeli government has said we're not returning to the old borders. Oh, that's a declaration. Once you've made that statement, it's a declaration of annexation. And if it's annexation, then you have to accept that when deciding whether or not Israel is an apartheid state, it can't be limited to Israel and its pre-June 67 border. It's the whole area, including the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, including Gaza. You know, I've heard people say that the majority of the Jewish people don't support the policy of the Israeli government when it comes to Palestine and Gaza and the West Bank. And um, how could that be? And can you speak to that? Like, I know the Likud party is like the extremist party, a right wing party in Israel. Um, what is what would you say the percentage of support they actually have in the population inside of Israel and out? Well, we should be clear that, number one, Benjamin, Benjamin Netanyahu, the prime minister of the state of Israel, uh, he's been the head of state now for about a decade, and he's gone through many elections. And even though he's surrounded by one scandal after another, uh, none of these scandals have actually made a big dent in his popularity. And the reason for that, I think, is pretty straightforward. It's pretty uncontroversial, at any rate, in my opinion. That is to say... Benjamin Netanyahu is an obnoxious, racist, Jewish supremacist. And in all of those descriptives, obnoxious, racist, Jewish supremacist, he's wholly representative of the Israeli population. And the reason they keep re-electing him, despite the scandals, which are always said to be imminently going to bring him down, despite the scandals that never bring him down, it's because when they look at Benjamin Netanyahu, most of the Israeli population, they see themselves. And they vote for him because in his mental outlook, I wouldn't really call it values, because I don't think people like Mr. Netanyahu have any values per se. But in terms of mental outlook, contempt for Arab, contempt for Arabs, contempt for Muslims. Actually, with all due respect to you, Mr. Dor, and all your listeners, unless they're Jewish, he has contempt for all of you. He's a Jewish supremacist, but he also happens to be in a separate category, a racist. And now, even though I don't like to use that terminology because it's too simple and too sloganeering, it happens to be, I think, in this particular circumstance, it's illuminating. Why did Mr. Netanyahu and Mr. Trump get along so well? Why is Mr. Netanyahu Mr. Trump's biggest cheerleader in the world? Well, the answer is simple. They both like walls. Mr. Trump wants to build a wall to keep out Mexicans. Mr. Netanyahu wants to build a wall to keep out Arabs. They both hate black people. Mr. Uh, Netanyahu, uh, uh, one of, when President Obama was uh, the head of state in the United States, uh, Mr. Netanyahu, he didn't see it at all amiss. 
he didn't see it at all awry for him to come barging in the United States, barging into the Capitol building and instructing, telling Obama what American policy should be towards Iran. I dare say, and of course you're free to contradict me, it's inconceivable, it's inconceivable had there been a white head of state, had it been George Bush, or even a Jimmy Carter, had it been even a Jimmy Carter, Mr. Netanyahu would not have dared carry on the way he did with Obama. He's a racist. And just like Mr. Trump, the racist, loathes Muslims, so Mr. Netanyahu, he loathes black people, which is why he made it a part of his policy to expel the Arab migrants, about 30,000, who were fleeing a war situation, fleeing a very serious um, life-challenging situations, and came as refugees to Israel. And he loathed it because you have to remember Mr. Netanyahu, he grew up a large part of his life was spent in the United States. His father... Uh, uh, I saw the professor that Netanyahu went to, uh, was a professor at Cornell University. And they hated black people, the Schwarzes, the Schwarzes as it's called, the black people, they loathed them. And so now for Mr. Netanyahu to have to face the prospect that the Schwarzes are invading Israel, so they have to go. And so it's that same mindset. It's not values. It's a mindset. Uh, you can choose what descriptive you want for that mindset. Some people would say it's a Nazi mindset. Some people would say it's a fascist mindset. Some people would call it a, uh, a right-wing uh, race, a white supremacist, white mindset, whatever you want to call it. Uh, they have it. And that's the Israeli people. It's a sorry thing to have to say, but I'm not one of those people who, in the name of political correctness, recoil at generalizations. If you could say most white people in the American South, in the pre-civil rights era, if you could say most of them were mean, white, racist supremacists, very few people would take issue with that quote-unquote generalization. But the moment you use exactly those same terms to describe Israel or Israelis, it suddenly becomes politically incorrect. I disagree. If you want to understand the Israeli mentality vis-a-vis Palestinians or Arabs or Muslims, it's very easy for an American to understand. Just look at Alabama, Mississippi, and all the other southern states in the pre-civil rights era. That's the mentality. That's the Israeli mentality. And Mr. Netanyahu, in his mindset, he's not very much different from a George Wallace or a Lester Maddox, for those who remember that era. So l- let me ask you do, do you, do the Jewish people or the people of Israel, do they not see the tremendous irony or the, that that's, that's actually being played out right now, that the Israeli state was invented as a safe haven for the Jewish people because they've been persecuted, and now they turn around and for the last couple of decades they've been doing the exact same thing? Or, or, or a very horrible thing, not the exact same thing, but a very similar thing to the Palestinian people, you know, making them be second-class citizens, stripping them of rights, controlling their movement in and out of wherever they go, and also having economic blockades and medical blockades. And, you know, um, like, like we've said, it's an open-air prison. Do they, do they really miss the irony of that? Do they not see that? Yes, I do think they don't see it. I do think they miss the irony. Um, first of all, remember, a large portion of Europeans who came to the United States, the pilgrims, the Puritans, 
they were fleeing religious persecution. And then they proceed to inflict a really quite grotesque crimes uh, on the indigenous population when they came here. The fact of the matter is, just as the uh, Euro settlers, who, white settlers who came here, the Euro Americans, they couldn't conceive the domestic population, the indigenous population, they couldn't conceive them as being human beings of the same order as themselves. They were savages. And the same way, the Israeli people can't conceive Arabs or Muslims as being on the same moral order as themselves. They're terrorists or they're savages. Um, so I, I think it's correct to say that they don't see anything awry in the way they're carrying on. In fact, if you read most of the testimonies uh, of Israelis uh, on the situation there, most Israelis have an, an, uh, a, a shot of interest in what goes on in the West Bank and Gaza. They live very good lives. They have a very high standard of living. They travel a lot. And the West Bank and Gaza, these are far off, distant, ex almost exotic places for Israelis. I know that might come as a surprise, but remember, for example, when I was growing up, uh, living in New York City, it's a compact city, as I suppose you know, 99% of white New Yorkers talked about Harlem, were terrified of Harlem, but had never stepped foot in Harlem. Mm -hmm. They had never seen it, let alone physically place themselves there. So, and it was a funny thing back then, when Europeans came over, uh, visitors, you know, young people, they, where you'd ask them, where are you living? And they would all say, Harlem, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because to them, Harlem was exciting. You know, it was clubs, it was jazz. <clears throat> but for white New Yorkers, Harlem was some sort of site of terror. Terror, everyone was, Harlem, you live in Harlem, oh my God. And I remember when I first went over to the occupied territories in 1988. So I lived with some families in the West Bank. And I told Israelis, I, you know, I, I went to the West Bank. You went to the West Bank? I mean, their eyes bulge. It's a foreign place to them. That's a, that's a so, great, I, I mean, these are, I, it's amazing these analogies you're making. They're very helpful, actually. Uh, 